I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 2. When I came in this morning, I met Ben Duffett over here and he said to me, Well, Pastor, how many sermons do you have left? What a way to greet you this morning. But uh, the number is six. And then he said, are, are the, did you save the best for last? And that puts a lot of pressure on a guy, you know. And that remains to be seen if it's the best for last. But today is important, I'll say that much. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you... You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's word for God's people today. Thanks be to God. Well, an important message, I think this is. I spent a morning with Southern Baptist evangelist Junior Hill a few years ago, and I asked him the question, if you had one sermon left to preach, one opportunity to stand in the pulpit and preach, what would your sermon be? I don't think he hesitated. He said, I would preach a simple sermon on how to be saved. How to be saved. Now, I've never forgotten that. And as I approach the end of uh, my ministry here and of my pastoral ministry, I think that I could do no better than to preach simply how to be saved. I'm doing it for two reasons. I want you to know, and I want to know that you know how to be saved. And I want you to know how to speak that message to somebody else, how you can persuade lovingly, winsomely persuade somebody to trust in Christ. And if you'll listen carefully today, I'll think you will be able to do that. Simply, how to be saved. Now, I hope that word's not off-putting to you, saved. A lot of folks don't want to use that. It sounds uh, old-fashioned, but it is a biblical term. It's right in our text this morning. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And so when we talk about a relationship with God and how to have one, there are basically two ways you can go. Two approaches, and all the religions of the world fall in one of these two categories. Either you believe that you can be saved by religious activity, religious acts, rituals, or you believe in the relationship provided for us in Christ Jesus. It's one or the other. And I want to ask you, how are you counting on heaven? How do you plan to be saved if not today, one day? How's it ever going to happen? Is it something you must do or is it something that he has provided? I saw in the newspaper this week a, a pathetic picture out of New Delhi, India. Hindus are in one of their religious festivals right now and they're down by the river Yamuna the river Yamuna, and they're wading in the water, worshiping the sun god. 
Yamoni is the princess, the daughter of the sun god, and, and she is the river. And so part of worship is to go down to the river and wade in the water and bathe. Now what makes it pathetic is, is how uh, misguided that is, but also how very polluted the river is. It's one of the most polluted rivers in the world right now. Human waste, uh, industrial effluence, uh, all kinds of water. There, a foam covers the water. And just before the religious festival, they try to hose it off. And yet people come to that place to be purified. That's the world's religion. Attempting to do something to please God a God so that that God will allow you into his presence. The great evangelist George Whitfield, I quoted him recently. I'm doing so again today. George Whitfield, he was a religious celebrity in colonial America. He said, what? Get to heaven on your own strength? Why, you might as well try to climb to the moon on a rope of sand. It's impossible. So there's a better way, and God has provided that way. There is but one way, and it is through God acting in Jesus. Now go back to Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to see the condition that requires this. Why do you need to be saved anyway? Why, why is it necessary? Well, in verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul calls us saints, or in my translation, holy people. It's the word saint. But in chapter 2, verse 1, he backs up and shows us what we used to be. Yeah, you're a saint now through faith in Christ, but what were you? And it's a rather hard message to swallow. We don't remember it. We tend to think we've always been pretty good people and, and on our own merit a place in God's kingdom. But Paul is quick to tell us, no, don't forget what you were. And what were we? Number one, we were dead. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Now, you're not dead this morning physically. You're very much alive. And mentally, you're thinking right now. Socially, you have relationships with other people. But spiritually, well, that's another matter. Spiritually, where you relate to God, that, that God-shaped void in the, in the middle of your being, from where you relate to God, you're dead. And there are no degrees to death. You're either dead or alive. And he's saying... You were dead. It's not in your actions. It is your condition. He says that the Gentiles, he's writing Gentiles. He says, you were dead in transgressions and sins. Verse 3, all of us, speaking of Jews. So it's Gentiles and Jews. And Paul includes even himself. We were all dead in transgressions and sins. Maybe that's why you can't relate to God very well. You don't, uh, you don't feel like praying. You, you don't feel like coming to church generally. You don't feel like living a life that pleases Him. Because to God, you are dead. Turn to Ezekiel in the Old Testament. Ezekiel, a very familiar image. Chapter 37, Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel has a vision of a valley of dry bones. Listen to it. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out of the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry this would have been a good Halloween sermon, actually. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. 
Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones, preach to them and say, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and I will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come, breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Write down Ezekiel 37. You're going to read that again. That's interesting imagery. But he's speaking to the Jewish people. And you're like a a valley of dry bones, but I'm going to bring you to life. And he's reminding us today that when we're not a Christian, we are really dead in transgressions and sins. But something else about our condition, we're dominated by the devil. Dominated by the devil. As for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Who's the ruler of the kingdom of the air? It's not God. Ultimately, he is absolute Lord. But in this age in which we live, he is the prince of the power of the air. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four says he's the God of this age. And it's none other than the devil himself. The devil is real. He exists. He roams the earth and he seeks to dominate our lives. The prince of the power of the air. And that is the mood of things, the culture. And you've seen it. You marvel sometimes at what's going on in our world and how can we have gotten to this point? And it's dominated by the evil one. And we're disobedient. Disobedient. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. We're disobedient. We live according to our passions, our impulses, physical desires and obsessions. We don't have the victory over it. They dominate us. Sometimes it's drugs or alcohol. Sometimes it's sex. Sometimes it's materialism. But we can't stop. We're dominated by the devil and disobedient and rebellious. And then one more thing about this condition. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the desires and thoughts like the rest We were by nature deserving of wrath. We're doomed. We're doomed. Judgment is coming. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against ungodliness, all ungodliness in the world. And we're standing under the wrath of God. Everybody loves John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But verse 18 talks about those who do not believe stand condemned already because they've not believed in the name of the Son of God. Doomed. My friend Anthony George says, this is not a trending topic in today's world. Folks don't want to believe it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hear. They don't want to believe that that God is a God of wrath. Now listen, what I've tried to do over these years is present to you a balanced view of God. 
And I've emphasized his mercy and grace and love. And I've emphasized his holiness. And I've emphasized that he cares for you and desires to know you and have a relationship with you. But we've always got to balance it with the other side of the coin. That God is a holy God and his wrath is poured out upon rebellion and sin. And if you're going to believe the one, you've got to believe the other. It's, it's two sides of one coin. And you either accept the grace of God and accept his love, or you're there for the wrath of God that is surely coming. It's not just coming at the end of time. Yes, there is a hell, but that wrath of God falls on rebellion now. And that may be what's going on in your life. You've rebelled against God. You're living according to the sins of the flesh. You are dead in transgressions and sins. And so the wrath of God is upon you. That's a pretty dismal picture. And I, I hate to start out the day with it. But Paul's reminding these Christians of what they used to be. And I hope it's all in the past tense for you. But maybe it's a current reality. So we come to the next verse. And we see the compassion that produces or provides salvation. All of us, verse 3, also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Now look at verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions and sins. It is by grace you have been saved. The King James Version puts those two words together. Verse 4, but God, and I like that, but God, who is rich in mercy. John Stott once said that the two most significant words ever uttered are those two, but God. It changes. The situation changes. You, you turn a corner. You're headed in one direction. And, and now the whole thrust of the, of the argument changes. Yes, we were dead and dominated by the evil one and disobedient and doomed. But, but God. And if it wasn't for that, that's our condition. But God, who is rich in mercy and love. That's what motivates him. It's not your goodness. It's not your performance. You straighten up and fly right. That's not what motivates salvation. We're incapable of that. We're motivated by his love and mercy. For God so loved the world. God is love. God who is rich in mercy. And I want you to have that image of God in your hearts and minds always. Yes, we all fall short. Yes, we are alienated from God, but he's not written us off. He still comes to us in Christ to offer us salvation. And he offers it as a free gift. For by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up, verse 6, with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now, you need to memorize verse 8 and 9. It's not too hard to do. I have a girlfriend that lives in England. She's five years old. Her name is Nora. And she... Uh, she FaceTimed me the other day. She had learned a verse, and she wanted to say it for me, and it was John 3.16. And I, I congratulated her, and I applauded for her, and I said, if you could only know one verse, that's the verse to know. For God so loved that he gave a free gift. The word grace is the word charis. It's free, unmerited. It is a gift. Paul uses the word grace a hundred times in his letters. It was a key theme for him, and it ought to be for us a free gift. We receive it by faith, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is our response. Faith is believing. Faith is trusting. It's leaning upon him. So he offers you a gift, 
the free gift of eternal life, you take the gift. There's only two things you can do with a gift. You can reject it. You can say, no, thank you. I appreciate it, but I'm not interested. Or you can accept it and say, thank you. Which have you done with God's amazing grace gift to us? Have you accepted it or rejected it? Now, why did God do it this way? For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's part of the answer. He does it this way so that none of us will stand in heaven one day and talk about what we did. How we gave so much money to the church or how we taught Bible fellowship or how we sang in the music ministry or how we helped uh, people in need. Are there are any number of things we could brag about, but none of it measures up to the gift of God. Lest there be no boasting. God forbid that I should glory in only the cross of Christ by which I am crucified to the world and the world's crucified to me. Galatians 6. It's his gift and we accept it. And we accept it by reaching out and coming to him. And you can do it in a prayer. And I try to get people to mean this from their heart. But, but in a prayer, you talk to God and you say, I thank you for what you've done for me. I thank you that Jesus died and rose again for my salvation and offers me now a free gift. And I take the gift. By faith. It's not a feeling. It's, it's an act of obedience. You receive the gift. And then one more thing about this being saved. A new creation demonstrates it. A new creation demonstrates it. Verse 6. You're changed. You're different. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He's talking about us. He raised us up and elevated us to a seat in heaven. This is written in the past tense, as if it's already happened, because it has already happened. In some way, and I can't explain this, it stumps me every time. In some sense, when Jesus arose... On that first Easter long ago, he came back from the dead. In some sense, we rose with him. And when Jesus ascended to heaven, in some way, we ascended with him. And when Jesus took his seat at the right hand of God the Father, in some strange way, we were seated too. And this is the position from which we live now. It's a secure place. We don't worry about being saved one day and lost the next. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In order, verse 7, that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It's a vast universe with galaxy upon galaxy extending beyond our imaginations. And it's all God's. God has created it all. And uh, perhaps there's life on other planets. I don't know. I tend to think there probably is. This verse is telling me that one of the things God is doing in saving us the way that he does is that he might demonstrate throughout all time and space his greatness and mercy and love. It's proof. You are proof that God is a great God. You're a trophy, a trophy of his grace for all to see. The angels, the demons, every being in the universe. And we give evidence of a new life. Evidence of a new life that he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now verse 10 is crucial. Because if we're not saved by works, what's the point? If we're not saved by performance, then why perform? Just 
Become a Christian and go on living the way you want to live. Look at verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, is the King James word, handiwork. We're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. There's a place for good works. There's a place for service and all the things we're doing for the kingdom of God, but it is not to earn salvation. It's to show gratitude for salvation. It's our way of saying, thank you. We received the gift, and now the rest of our lives, we want to honor you and serve you. And God's plan is from the beginning that we would do that thing that we would serve him. But but I like the word, verse 10, we are God's handiwork. That's the word poema. You could translate it poem. We are God's poem. We're God's masterpiece. His work of art. That's you and me. God saved us to create in us a masterpiece. A wealthy, famous man sat for a portrait, and when the portrait was unveiled, he said, it was a great compliment to the artist, in the future, when people look at this painting, they're not going to wonder, who is the man in that picture? They will wonder, who was the artist who painted such a picture? And all the glory goes to God. You're his handiwork, exhibit A of His grace, if you've trusted in Christ and believe on His name. Would you pray with me, please? If you have never called out to Him, you can't remember ever doing it, you've never said, please, Lord, come into my heart. I give my life to you. I trust in you. Why don't you do it right now? Why wait another moment You'll never be able to work enough to earn this. You must take it as a free gift. 